Welcome to today's video. Today we're going to be talking all about what to eat if you have chronic digestive problems. So this is going to be suitable for people with SIBO, Candida, IBS, IBD, and this is actually the foundation of basically everything you need to know about nutrition. So I'm, first of all, let me just say, not a, not a nutritionist, not a doctor, but I've dedicated my life to learning this. So if there's information about this on the internet, guarantee you I've read it. I've picked together all of, all of it, because the internet is so full of of good stuff and bad stuff. I've been through everything there is. I've tried every single diet. I've tried vegan, keto, paleo, GAPS. I've, I've tried everything, okay? I've tried every single diet. I've read literally all the information there is to read on the whole internet about different microbes and nutrients. And like, I've, I've built this comprehensive map inside my head of all of this knowledge. And now I wanna just regurgitate it all out <laughs> so that you have this information as well. So. I've structured, as you can see, this is a very, a very intensive board today. We're gonna to be going through a lot of stuff. So by the end of this, you're gonna know everything there is to know about diet, about nutrition, especially if you have digestive problems. So this is the foundation of nutrition for everything. If you're a healthy person, this is essential to know. If you do bodybuilding, weightlifting, this is essential to know. If you have any other type of chronic health problem, adrenal fatigue, chronic fatigue syndrome, an autoimmune condition, this is still essential to know. But this is especially through the lens of digestive problems because when we're looking at digestive problems, it can be even harder to figure out what we're supposed to eat because we've got reactions, we've got intolerances, we've got all of these different problems. So I've spent my last six years of my life dedicated to figuring this out. I've got it all up here. Once I learn something that is important and that is actually helpful for me on my healing process, it sticks. You know, it's just stuck in my brain. So you can see all of this, this is just regurgitated from, from knowledge. I didn't do any research to do this, because I've done the research over the last six years, it's, it's in there and I, and I get this and I wanna share it with you. So this is, why, why am I doing this? Why did I learn all of this information? So I had SIBO, Candida and IBS and a whole host of other different health problems. I had chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, mold and Lyme, chronic inflammatory response, I had histamine intolerance, I had muscle activation syndrome, I had so many different problems. And most of those are gone now. So I don't have any of those um, chronic fatigue syndrome, I don't have the histamine intolerance, all of this stuff is, is controlled. Is my digestive system 100%? No, it's not. And this is something that's gonna take me some time. For me, I was on an extremely restrictive diet of eating about five foods for about five years. If you're gonna do something like that, so if you get stuck on a carnivore diet or a really restrictive diet, it's gonna take time to build yourself back up, even if you are doing everything right. It's a process that takes some time. And I'm still in that process now. But I'm at the point where my digestive system is, I almost don't have to even think about it. I can basically eat anything and anything I want. Things that were off limits for years, like gluten and dairy, like they don't give me a problem anymore. So we can get you to that point, and this is the foundation of understanding. Once you understand all of this, you're gonna know how to build a healing diet. So let's get started with it what to eat with chronic digestive problems. So we have four key points that we're gonna go over here and we're gonna, we're gonna touch on them here and then we're gonna elaborate on them further down. And these are, the, these, are the four, these are the four most important things to know if you have just about nutrition, about digestion in general. So we've got nutrient density, bioavailability, digestibility and digestive capacity. So these are some concepts that once you understand, they're going to absolutely revolutionize and completely change the way that you think about diet and nutrition. So let's just dive straight into it, point number one. We've got nutrient density. So nutrient density would basically be described as when you eat a food, so you're gonna eat a certain quantity of food and it's gonna have a certain amount of nutrients in it. So if you take, let's say like one of the most, one of the lowest nutrient density foods is like really refined white flour products. So like bread that you might buy at the store or just like generic pasta. These, are, these really don't have many nutrients in them. I'm not saying don't eat them, so we're gonna touch more on that further down, but I'm just saying these are very low in nutrient density as opposed to other foods that have, that you eat a relatively small amount and you'll get a lot of nutrition. So what we wanna do at this stage is to just focus on nutrient density and focus on incorporating or increasing the foods that you have in your diet that are higher in the nutrients. So this way your diet is more focused and orientated around larger amounts of foods that are higher in nutrient density. So 
when we're looking at nutrient density, we've got the different types of, of vitamins. So we're going to look at vitamins first of all. So we've got fat soluble vitamins, A, D, E, F, and K. And you've got the water soluble vitamins, B, C, and you've also got protein as well. There are other compounds here as well. So I didn't even touch on minerals. I didn't touch on different types of plant flavonoids and things like that. But that will kind of be covered when we look down here at um, bioavailability and digestibility because we've got things like, uh, where is it? We have juicing here, so we're going to talk about that. So these other things will pop up. But for now, we're just looking at, at vitamins because this is just going to give you a good idea, a good general idea. So the best sources of the fat-soluble nutrients, A, D, E, F, and K, are liver, egg yolks, and fish, especially the oily fish. And that makes sense because you think these are foods that are kind of fatty. They have a higher fat content. And this is because fat-soluble nutrients means these are nutrients that are dissolved in fat. If you're eating a low-fat diet or if you're eating foods that don't have any fat in them, they're going to be really low in the fat-soluble nutrients because you need to have fat to have fat-soluble nutrients in them. For vitamin A, you absolutely nothing is going to beat liver. It is absolutely the best. For vitamin D, that's really something you should be getting from the sun. So vitamin D is made when your body turns cholesterol into vitamin D. It uses cholesterol as the primary ingredient to make vitamin D. So in this case, getting vitamin D from your diet isn't so important, but what is important is the precursor, which is saturated fat. Your body takes saturated fat, turns saturated fat into cholesterol, and then turns cholesterol into vitamin D. So for vitamin D, it's not so important that you have vitamin D itself in the food because there aren't really many foods that have high vitamin D content. And you would instead want to make sure you're having enough saturated fat and cholesterol and then having enough sun exposure so you can synthesize vitamin D yourself. Vitamin E, honestly, probably the least important nutrient. It's primarily just used as an antioxidant. It's really not that important. It's, the, it's a plant-based um, fat-soluble vitamin. So you get this in like olive oil, you get this in avocados. Probably, I would say this is like the least important nutrient on this whole thing. So vitamin E, I feel like it's like, <laughs> it's, so, it's, it's, it's not very valuable. I wouldn't worry so much about vitamin E. Vitamin F, really important. Vitamin F is the essential fatty acids. So these are your omega-3s and your omega-6s. The ones of, that are worth noting are your EPA and your DHA. So these are the omega-3 fatty acids that your body actually needs and uses to basically rebuild itself. They're like key components of your nervous system. So one example of here, so we're gonna, we're gonna, I'm gonna just touch slightly on this right now with the, uh, the bioavailability component. Is it the bioavailability? Yeah, exactly, the bioavailability component. So you could say that one of the omega-3s is like flaxseed oil. And, but this, the thing is, this is a form, so this is linoleic acid, this is a form of of omega-3s that's not really usable by the body. The conversion rate inside the body from, so you can convert these things around. So you can convert, convert e, uh, LNA, linoleic acid, into EPA and EPA into DHA. But you can only do this at about, about one in a hundred. So it's like a 1% conversion rate. So to go from LNA, the, the, the plant form, the flaxseed oil form, into EPA, you're only gonna convert about 1% of that. And then of that 1%, you, convert, you can convert that 1% then into DHA. So we're gonna to touch more on bioavailability in a minute, but f just looking at the omega-3s, it's really important that we have a form that is actually usable. So flaxseed oil is really, it's garbage, it's trash, it's, it's, it doesn't really help. In this case, this is, when we're talking about essential fatty acids, we're talking really EPA and DHA. They're the ones that are really gonna make the difference. And vitamin K, the most important one here. So you've got K1 and K2. K2 is, is way more important. K1 is, is a plant-based form of vitamin K. It's used in the, the blood clotting process. Basically, if you eat any plant matter at all, it's not even a question of being a problem for you. And even still, even if you eat a carnivore diet, you're still probably gonna get enough just through that anyway. So I find K K1, never really a problem. K2, more of a significant problem. K2 is really important because it works with D3 and it tells, first of all, D3 and K2 kind of work like hormones in your body. So they're gonna affect how you feel, which is really important, especially if you have a mood disorder. Mental health problems can be really connected to the gut and this is one of those really important reasons. But it also tells the body to absorb calcium from the digestive system and then to take the calcium once it's absorbed into the bloodstream and move it into the bones and teeth. So this is, this is massively important. If you have any kind of like osteoporosis or cavities, it's way less likely to be a calcium problem and way more likely to be a D3 or K2 problem. So you wanna make sure that you've got these in your diet. 
Best sources of these are liver, egg yolks, and fish. Fish is especially good for the essential fatty acids. And vitamin K2, especially good in the egg yolk. Any, any of the, the fatty animal products you have that are a yellow in color. So I think like grass-fed, butter is a really good option. Ghee is also a good option. And you can actually get some K2 in a fermented food called natto as well. So that's also a really good option, a plant-based option. Then we've got water-soluble nutrients. I think fat-soluble nutrients are like overwhelmingly important and they're kind of underrated. Vitamin A, massive. Vitamin D, massive. Essential fatty acids, massive. Vitamin K2, massive. Super important. If you can focus and make sure that you're getting enough of these in your diet through forms that are actually bioavailable, we're gonna talk more about that in the bioavailability section, it's gonna make a massive difference because these, the, these are what fuel your immune system, these are what allow your gut to repair, like these are super important. So water soluble, vitamin C, again, if you're eating any kind of plant matter at all, probably getting more than enough vitamin C. Vitamin C is like, it's not really that important if you're eating animal foods, especially good quality collagen, because your body uses most of the vitamin C, like the high intake requirement of vitamin C is actually because your body uses vitamin C to make collagen. And if it has excess, it will use the vitamin C as an antioxidant. So. We're gonna talk about juicing in a minute. Juicing is gonna cover that and everything else in, in, in more, more than enough. So we're gonna cover that, cover that really well. Vitamin B, so it's difficult we say vitamin B because vitamin B isn't just one vitamin. It's a complex of different, different basically like you've got like B1, B2, B6, B9, B12. You've got all of these different types of B vitamins. But the thing that's really interesting about these is they're all categorized together because usually when you find one, you find most of them in these foods. And without a doubt, the food that has the most is liver. So liver is really like a superfood. It's, if you've, if you've heard of like the term superfood before and you think like, like maybe like raw cacao and spirulina and blueberries or some other type of like crazy like berry that is like overhyped, they're like down here, okay? Liver is up here, it's on a different planet. Liver is by far the most nutrient dense food when it comes to all of the fat soluble vitamins and vitamin B, and if you, eat, if you eat it like not fully cooked, so you eat it kind of raw in the middle still, or even if you just eat it raw, I know some people do that, you get vitamin C in that as well. So you can just, you get everything from liver. It's, it's absolutely unbeatable. You don't need it though. I w so I had intolerances to things like histamine, and I didn't tolerate liver very well while I was healing. And I just, I just basically overloaded on egg yolks. I was doing like up to 20 egg yolks a day, and that gave me more than enough of all of these nutrients. It covered all of those bases for me. So you just have to work with what you've got. But if you can do liver, you'd be silly not to. Um, and then we have, we have juicing here. So juicing is also a really good source of B vitamins. You're not gonna get any B12 from that. B12 you're basically only getting from animal sources. And again, liver, absolutely the highest thing you're gonna, gonna get it from. So juicing is really nice. We're gonna cover juicing more probably down here. But juicing is, you're, you're basically concentrating the nutrition that's available in plants. You're removing all of the plant stuff that you can't digest and concentrating all of the stuff that's powerful for you. So juicing is a really good option because it's gonna concentrate the B vitamin content and the vitamin C content and the bioflavonoids and the plant polyphenols and all the other different compounds that are in there. You're gonna concentrate them massively. So juicing can be a really good option. And finally, we've got stock and broth. I could hardly make a video about healing digestive problems without talking about stock and broth. So this is gonna be one of the best forms of protein that you can get because it's, it's very much pre-digested. And we're gonna talk a bit more about that when we come down here to digestibility. But it, it's very nice because it's a full, if you're eating an animal product, you're getting the full blend of amino acids that you need. And again, we'll talk more about that in, in the next section. We're gonna talk about that, that's funny. As you can see, we've got here venom versus chicken. We'll talk about that, it's quite fun. But this is gonna give you a really good bioavailable source of a lot of different free form amino acids and things that are really helpful for healing the gut. And then if you eat the animal that was cooked in it as well. So if you're, if, the, if you're new to this, I would definitely suggest you check out Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride's The Gaps Diet and look at the meat stock, not the bone broth. Look at the meat stock. It's a way gentler, softer way to start. If you have histamine problems, you might be, toler might be able to tolerate that. I find it works a lot gently and more softly. 
unfortunately, this is also something I didn't tolerate when I was healing. And I'm just throwing this out there to help you realize that you might be going through this video thinking like, oh, I can do this, oh, I can't do that. Oh, I can do this, oh, I can't do that. I can't do most of this stuff, I'm never gonna heal. That's not true, you're gonna heal regardless. I'm just trying to give you all of the information that you need and you just take what you can from it and you just use what, what applies to you, okay? Half of this stuff that I'm suggesting to you works in theory, didn't work for me when I was in my, in my healing process. So I expect the same is gonna be true for you. You may be intolerant to vegetables, so juicing doesn't work for you. You may be a fine with liver, but you have a fish allergy and you're allergic to egg yolks. We'll just go with the liver then, like go with what works for you. But there'll be something here that works for you. You'll get something out of this. So next we're gonna look, the second concept that we're gonna look at is called bioavailability. So basically what we're doing here is we're, we're looking at the total amount of nutrients in the food versus the amount of nutrients that are in the food that are actually usable. So just because there's a nutrient in a food doesn't mean your body can actually use it. A really good example of this would be to look at, like spinach is a good, a good example, because you'd say spinach is a really high source of calcium. Spinach has lots of calcium in it. The thing is, it's also very high in oxalate. So oxalate is a, is a type of anti-nutrient and it will bind with the calcium in the gut and form a crystal and it will just be excreted. So even though, like on paper, spinach has more calcium than say, like red meat for example, the amount of actual bioavailable calcium in the food is actually incredibly low because it has a very high anti-nutrient content. So when it comes to this, we need to look at what can we do to process the food in a way where we remove the things that make the, the resources, the nutrients in the food inaccessible. So some examples that I have here for total versus usable. So we're gonna look, first of all, we're gonna, I'm gonna do a vitamin, I'm gonna do a mineral, and I'm gonna do a protein, and then there's, there's more that this applies to as well. But I'm just gonna give you some examples here. So vitamins, so for example, carotenoids, these are pre-vitamin A. So these are the precursor that your body can use to turn into vitamin A, versus retinol, which is like real vitamin A. This is, this is actually vitamin A. So retinol, you only find in animal foods. You do not find any true vitamin A in plant foods. They just, they just don't have it. And carotenoids are the precursor. So an animal or your, you can turn some carotenoids into vitamin A. So when you're looking at your vitamin A intake, it's a really bad idea to assume that any of the vitamin A that you're getting from plants is actually bioavailable. Because first of all, you don't absorb them anywhere nearly as well as you do retinol. And even when you do absorb them, you have to convert them into vitamin A as well. And if you have some kind of chronic health problem, your conversion rate is probably gonna be less than a healthy person's, which is already very, very low. So when you, when you consider things like bioavailability of absorption, the amount that gets absorbed, and the conversion rate from what you've actually eaten, or from what has been absorbed, to then what is actually turned into vitamin A, it's pathetically low, about 4%. So say you eat 100% of your RDA or vitamin A from kale or from some kind of vegetable that's not actually got any vitamin A in it, it has pre, it's got pre-vitamin A, it's got carotenoids. If you're in a chronic, if you're in perfect optimal health and your digestion's working great and you've got good bile flow and your microbiome's on point, you're gonna absorb and use about 4% of those carotenoids as actual vitamin A. So, this, is, this gives you a really good example of, it's not just about what it says on the label, you really have to look into, is this actually a bioavailable form of this nutrient? So this is one of the most extreme examples. And I also touched on, we were talking about the, the, um, the omega-3s. Yeah, you can drink a whole tablespoon of flaxseed oil, but if you actually need the, e, the, the EPA or the DHA, the conversion rate is gonna be a hundredth or a thousandth as small as the dosage, assuming you're a healthy person, which if you're watching this, probably not. So the conversion rate is going to be even lower. So you have to make sure you're getting these things in a bioavailable form that your body doesn't have to do any work to actually use. It needs it to be in the form that, it's, that it needs already. Next, we can look at minerals. So we're gonna look at iron here. So the difference between iron and heme iron is, again, it's bioavailability. So you might see like cornflakes, for example, they have added iron and you think, oh cool, I can get, I've got anemia, this is gonna be really helpful to eat this cereal because it's got this, this iron in it. The thing is, if you get a magnet and you hold it next to the cornflakes when they're floating in the milk, they will come towards the magnet because this is not a bioavailable form of heme iron. This is like they've dug into the earth and they've 
they've extracted iron ore and they've sprinkled that on your cornflakes. This doesn't mean you can't use any of this. You can, but you need the right microbiome to be able to do it. Your microbiome is gonna take this non-heme iron, this, this basically rock, this inner rock, and this is, I'm using iron as an example here, this is true for calcium. So you have calcium carbonate, that is a rock. You don't need calcium carbonate. You don't need like magnesium oxide, for example, or a magnesium bound to some kind of mineral. It's not bioavailable, it's just a rock. And your microbiome has to work on breaking this down and binding it to an amino acid or to some, to an ascorbate or to some other kind of compound that is gonna allow it to actually be used as a bioavailable nutrient. So you wanna watch out for just because it says it has iron doesn't mean it's iron that you want. The type of iron that you want is heme iron. And you again, you only find this in animal products. And the place you will find the most of it is liver. So again, superfood liver, way miles above the rest. So any iron that you find in animal products is heme iron. That you can get some forms of bioavailable iron in plants. I was using the cornflakes example as, a, as an extreme because it's an artificial form of iron that's been added in. But it's gonna be, None of, the, none of the iron that's in plants is heme iron. Heme iron is a type of biological iron that, that we use, and the reason we use iron is, you, you can hear the word heme, so it's like heme, hemoglobin, it's part of how we basically move blood around, uh, oxygen around through our blood. So we use this, this, this process, and your body needs to turn it into this if it isn't this form already. So making sure you have enough of this can be helpful, but if you're getting it from a plant food form, it's not gonna be heme iron, so your body's gonna have to do extra work to make it usable again. And then finally over here, we've got venom versus chicken. So this is a type of protein. So spider venom, snake venom is protein. It's literally like 100% protein. So if you wanna eat a lean protein diet, you can go and eat spider venom and you'll be fine, right? That's not how it works. Because yeah, just because it's protein doesn't mean it's actually healthy for you. And the same is, the same is true for other things as well. Obviously this is an extreme example and disclaimer in case you didn't figure that out, I'm not saying go and eat spider venom or snake venom. It's not gonna give you a lean source of protein. It's gonna kill you and that's the whole point, right? So when you hear the word protein, you just think like all proteins are the same and they're not. Prote your, your proteins aren't even really a thing. Proteins are a group. They're, they're sort of like a subcategory of, of amino acids. Amino acids are what's important. And you wanna make sure you're giving your body the amino acids that it needs, not just the protein that it needs. So this is one reason that if you look at, say for example, we'll look at like a vegan protein powder, most of the time they don't have just one ingredient. They have a whole blend of different types of plants because different plants, like plants generally, and, and actually I can't think of any, they, they don't have a full, a full spectrum blend of proteins. So I'm not saying that it's not possible to build a full spectrum blend of proteins, and you can do that by combining different things, but it, it's a bit complicated. And because again, so this is the plant food versus the animal food thing. The forms of protein in these foods aren't as bioavailable as they are in animal foods, especially when we're gonna come down here and we're gonna look at the digestibility component. How is it cooked? Because almost without exception, animal foods are always easier to digest than plant foods, almost always. So there's a bioavailability component to this as well. So when we, when we're trying different, different foods, so let, let's, let's transition into this actually. This is a really nice, a nice transition point because we're talking about protein. So we're gonna look at bioavailability, bioavailability of foods. So, so, so no, just before I transition. So we, one, one reason animal foods can be, can be superior is they have a full spectrum blend of amino acids already. You don't have to do any research or any work or have any concerns about getting a full blend of amino acids because all animal foods have a full blend of amino acids in a more bioavailable form. So this is one reason, I'm, not, I'm definitely not saying you can't heal on a vegan diet. What I am saying is it can be more complicated for some because of these bioavailability and covering these nutrient density components of making sure you're actually getting the right blend of bioavailable nutrients. So for this reason, I find it so much easier to heal with animal foods. They've been profoundly helpful in my healing process. If you wanna go vegan, like you, you do you, you know? If you're watching this and you're like, I'm doing this in the vegan way, you do what you want, okay? That's totally fine for you. I'm saying, it's, I've, in my experience, it's way harder and I actually don't even work with people that won't try animal foods because it, it, healing is already really hard, you know? This is, this is already a, 
a tricky process to navigate and I don't want to make it any harder than it needs to be. So I just think having some animal products can help because the, the form of protein is a full spectrum. You know you're getting everything and you don't have to worry about it. And obviously don't eat spider venom, not good for you. So how is it cooked? We'll tie this into this, this component as I was just about to do. So we have to look at how different foods appear to us and how digestible they are based on how we've prepared them. So imagine a raw carrot versus a cooked carrot. Imagine how crunchy and hard and abrasive the fiber is in a raw carrot versus a carrot that you've turned into soup, for example. So you've, you've put it in water, you've boiled it for an hour, and then you've blended it. Like how much easier is it gonna be able to digest the carrot that has been turned into soup versus a raw carrot? So it's the same food, right? But this, this matters. How food is prepared matters. So I've got a few examples here. We've got, so the green color indicates the easier form. The red color indicates the more difficult form. And again, and even with all of this, I'm not saying don't have, don't have the red one. I'm not saying like don't have, like I said, white bread. I, had, I said cornflakes. I'm not saying don't eat these foods. What I'm saying is, Make sure that if you are eating those foods, you're also incorporating the bioavailable, nutrient-dense foods alongside them. That's what's really important. So you can still have raw carrots. You can still add raw carrots to your salad. Just know that it's less bioavailable than, uh, than a cooked carrot, for example. So we've got fermented versus raw. Fermented foods are always going to be more digestible and more bioavailable than raw foods because your, the bacteria that are present in the fermentation process have started that digestion process already. So your body is gonna to have to do less work because it's already started to be broken down. Over here, we've got juicing versus raw. This is a really nice one because this allows us to, as I mentioned when we were talking about the uh, nutrient density, this allows us not only to, imagine trying to eat a whole, a whole celery plant. It would take you probably an hour and you're gonna feel so full at the end of it and you've got almost no nutrition. But you can just throw that in the juicer, shrink it down into like a, a glass like this, and now you can have all of the nutrients, all of the benefits, all of the B vitamins, all of the polyphenols, all of the electrolytes, all of the beneficial substances, and remove all of the, the stuff that's in there that you can't digest. You literally get rid of all of the fiber, you get rid of all of the indigestible material, like fiber by definition means an indigestible carbohydrate. So we just remove all of that, you can't digest it anyway, and it allows us to concentrate those nutrients down. And this improves the, the bioavailability of the nutrients because you've, first of all, you've concentrated them, which is gonna help, but you've also removed all of this fiber, which can really irritate the gut. So we've made it, we've, we've prepared it, we've, we haven't really cooked it, but we've prepared it in such a way that has made it less taxing on the digestive system. And then finally, we've got steamed versus fried. So use this, the example here is think of say like a steamed chicken, be chicken breast versus a fried chicken breast. Think about how, say it's been, it's been steamed, you could even use boiled as an example as well. So say you've made like chicken soup, you pick, you pick the chicken out with your, with your fork and it just falls apart versus if you fry it, it's kind of tough. And that's, that process of digestion is gonna have to happen in your gut. Your acid is gonna have to be stronger. Your digestion is gonna have to work harder to break this food down to dissolve it and to make those nutrients bioavailable. Whereas if you steamed it or, or boiled it, it's, gonna, it's just gonna fall apart in your mouth and then by the time it reaches your stomach, your stomach doesn't have to work so hard to release the nutrients that are stored in that food. And I've got a little side note here, is blending. So when it, whether it's raw, whether it's cooked, if you blend it, you're basically taking all the work out of your teeth. And if you, can, if you can do this and you can eat it like a soup or a smoothie, for example, like say it's raw and you're having a smoothie, this can be really helpful because you've made it so that you've got as much surface area on the food as possible. So it's gonna, your digestive machinery, even if it's struggling, is gonna be able to have the maximum impact that it can because you have so much surface area. So you can blend stuff. You increase the surface area, you don't have to chew it so much, and it's just gonna help your digestion overall. So this could be like soups if it's cooked, and this, but this could be anything, you know, like say for example, you're gonna have more bioavailability and more digestibility of, instead of having chickpeas, having hummus, because the hummus is blended and it's got more surface area and your body has to do less work to digest it. So again, think like a raw avocado versus guacamole. It's already mashed up. 
your body has to, because you think your stomach's just sitting here and it just like squirts a bit of acid and then stuff, like your stomach's a muscle. It's like churning it around and gurgling it apart and it really puts in a lot of work. And if it's struggling, the less work we give it, the less work it has to do. And it's easier for it to digest and process the food. So we can, we can improve the digestion a lot just by completely, like completely the same food, you know? Raw chicken breast versus fried chicken, ve- chicken breast versus boiled chicken breast. Completely different levels of bioavailability and digestibility. And we can blend it as well. Raw carrot versus raw carrot blended versus raw carrot juiced, really high bioavailability, versus boil the carrot, turn it into soup, also really high bioavailability. Just, they're giving you different things. So just, just bear these, these thoughts in mind because they make a massive difference. You might find you don't tolerate raw carrots, but you tolerate carrot juice, fine. Or you don't tolerate carrot juice because there's something in there that's raw that you don't tolerate, but you could do carrot soup okay. So just because you've had a food sensitivity to one food in one form does not by any mean mean that food is out. So play with these things. Like I didn't tolerate any vegetables, but I could drink kale juice, fine. So I find that people usually have what I call like a spirit vegetable. <laughs> so if you have a lot of sensitivities, you usually have at least one vegetable that you can tolerate to some extent. So explore, find your spirit vegetable. Let me know what it is. Do you know what your spirit ve- vegetable is? Let me know. So moving down here into the, into the final part of the board, part number four. So we've got digestive capacity. What I've said from one, two, and three, they are universal for everybody. This part four is a little bit more individualized. This is gonna be slightly different for anyone listening based on what symptoms you have, like your root cause, what, what foods you, pro- you have problems with digestion, but this is, so this is individual. So digestive capacity as a concept is eating food you can actually digest. So this is one of the most important things about the healing process. If you eat food that you don't have capacity to digest and absorb, not only does it not help you, it actually makes you sicker. So if you're eating something that you don't have the capacity to digest, it's, you're not gonna get the nutrients from it, so you're not gonna absorb anything, it's not gonna benefit you in any way, but it can trigger autoimmunity, it can trigger leaky gut, it feeds microbes and pathogens in the gut that you don't wanna feed, and it's not even that these things are pathogenic, they're just there as an adaptive response to help break down this food that you don't have the capacity to break down, digest, and absorb. So it's not even that these things are really bad, they're an adaptive response to you eating food you can't digest. So this is really important. We have to make sure that the food that you eat, you actually have the machinery available in your body to break down, digest, and absorb. If you don't, the food is not helping you, it's just making you sick. So I've got the the primary, like the culprits, the things that people have sensitivities to here, and we're gonna talk about them, and we're gonna look at these through the lens of the five pillars. So if you're not aware of what the five pillars is, go and check some of my other videos. I talk about them in plenty of videos. I also have a course all about the five pillars. So the five pillars can be defined as the five primary core functions of the digestive system. These are systems that are indivisible. So these systems are stomach acid, digestive enzymes, bile, motility, mucosa. These are the five primary functions of your digestive system. If you have any type of digestive problem, I guarantee, without exception, it is one or more of these five pillars. For me, in my case, with my extreme level of digestive problems, it was all five. I had stomach acid problems, I had digestive enzyme problems, I had bile problems, I had motility problems, and I had mucosa problems. And I had microbiome problems as well. So these five pillars, they're, they, they're on a, a foundation, a base of a healthy microflora. But we will talk about that just down here. I don't know if you can actually see this. Maybe it's just out of the frame of the camera. But we'll talk about that in a minute. So we're going to look at, th- at what we've talked about so far through this lens because it helps to give you some understanding on actionable steps we can actually take to support anywhere your body is struggling with its digestive capacity. So imagine like... Say, so what usually happens is when people have like some food sensitivity or they have some digestive upset is they usually have certain food triggers. And these triggers aren't random, they're very specific and they give us clues about what's, what is dysfunctional in the digestive system, what mechanism, wh- what of the five pillars is struggling and how does it need support. So I'm gonna go through these and you're gonna, you're gonna see how this all magically pieces itself together as we go through. So first of all, we talk about protein because I think it's just a good place to start. And it's also where we start in the digestive process. So the first and most important step in protein digestion is stomach acid. 
So this is the first pillar, and this is one reason that it's so important, is it dissolves everything. So everything that goes into your stomach, before it leaves your stomach and reaches your small intestine, it should be liquid. It should be completely liquefied. And this is one reason the whole blend it up, have a smoothie, have a soup, can be really helpful because you've already pre-blended it. You've already helped your stomach to do this. You've already helped to liquefy it. So acid is really important in this protein digestion process. If you have bowel movements where you see undigested protein, you, you, ha you have to have low stomach acid. It's, you, you just need to. It's just not, it's physiologically not possible for it to be any other way around. So the acid is what liquefies these things and it's what turns these proteins into amino acids so that they can be digested and absorbed. So if you get, if you feel really full when you have protein or if you have an aversion to eating animal products or when you eat lots of protein, you get lots of gas or digestive upset or eating protein triggers things like reflux or heartburn or gastroparesis or you see like undigested meat in the stool, that's a stomach acid problem. That means your digestive capacity with regards to anything that needs to be digested with stomach acid is low and we need to support it. And you can do that by, first of all, working on how is it cooked, you know? Instead of having uh, a fried chicken breast, have chicken soup so the chicken is blended. That's gonna help tremendously. But more than that, we can look at things like, so this is more what the course is designed to do. It's more designed to give you like supplemental suggestions on what you can do to support each pillar. So I'm gonna give you the examples here, but this is a pretty long video already. So I'm gonna, if you're interested in that, check out the course, I'll leave a link below. So as far as stomach acid goes, we can support this by making sure that we don't drink excess fluids with our food. So reducing the dilution of the acid that we already produce can be really helpful. But if those two changes alone aren't enough, then we can look at supporting it a the next level further. So if you tolerate like lemon or vinegar, we can add those to the food. That can be really helpful. I had, I was working with a, with a lady for her, for her child, for her, for her daughter, and just having apple cider vinegar with the food alone, and fortunately she really likes apple cider vinegar. The little girl really likes apple cider vinegar. So she's just, she just drinks it quite happily. So we just put some of that in the food, make the broth with it, do all of these things, and that boosts the stomach acid and it improves digestion a lot. And if, so this, when you're working with kids, supplementation can be kind of hard because they can't really talk. They can't really tell you, ow, my stomach's hurting or it's burning or this supplement doesn't agree with me. But when you're using food, it's quite safe. So this was a really good option. But if you want to take that a step further, you could look at stomach acid supplementation. So using something like betaine HCL with pepsin. So the betaine HCL is the acid. The pepsin is the digestive enzyme that is activated by your stomach acid. So your acid gets low enough in your stomach. So your acid, so when I say low, it means the pH gets low, which means your acid gets strong. Your acid gets very, very strong, and it activates the enzyme pepsin, which is what breaks the proteins down into the individual, individual amino acids. So that's a really good clue there. If you have a problem with fats, so if you've got a, if you go to the toilet after having fat and you notice there's a film on the top, that's more of a gallbladder bile pillar problem. So this would be the third pillar. But if you go to the toilet and you don't have an oil film, you don't have shiny stool, but the, the stool is floating in the toilet, this would be more of a digestive enzyme problem. So the first case indicates there's a bile problem. The bile isn't flowing, and the bile is what mixes with the fat to emulsify it, that makes it dissolvable in, in liquids, which is required in the digestion process. If it's the second one, then this part is happening okay, the bile is fine, but you're not producing enough lipase. This is the fat digestion enzyme that helps you to absorb the, the fats from the food after it's been emulsified into, the, into your body. So there are other enzymes, but for the sake of today, we're just gonna cover that here. Again, if you want more info, check out the course. That'll be really helpful for you with that. Starch, so starch, if you have problems with starch, so this would be things like rice, um, potatoes, breads, pasta. If you have a problem with all starch, there's a good likelihood you're low in amylase. Amylase is the digestive enzyme that you produce in your mouth and you produce from your pancreas as well. This is triggered after your stomach releases. So after your stomach contents leave and enter the small intestine, you will have a release of, of amylase as well. So if you're low in amylase, you're gonna not be able to digest these foods properly. They're gonna make you probably feel really bloated, make you feel really gassy. They're, there's a good likelihood that they will trigger autoimmunity. They might trigger histamine problems and mast cell activation problems. They can cause a lot of pain, discomfort, blowing, and gas in the gut. They can trigger diarrhea, they can trigger constipation. And again, it's because you're not digesting the food properly. So 
In this case, supplementing with a digestive enzyme that has amylase in is definitely going to be your best bet. Over here, we've got dye and monosaccharide sugars. So this, you would see this more as a problem with, uh, so for example, lactose or refined sugar or things like things that have like fructose in, so fruit or, so these are, are more, these, these, these are a type of sugar that are more broken down. And the monosaccharides are already to be digested and absorbed. The disaccharides, they still need a step in the digestive process. If it's more of a disaccharides thing, this is a good indicator that you have weak brush border enzymes in your mucosa. So I've done this before. You've probably seen me do it if you've watched my videos before. In your Activia uh, adverts, the Yakult adverts, I'm sure you've probably seen them on TV, you've got these little wiggly microvilli. On the surface of all of these microvilli, you have brush border enzymes. These are the enzymes that help in that final stage of starch digestion, that help you digest lactose, sucrose, basically anything that ends in O's for the most part is digest from, digested from your brush border enzymes. So if these are damaged, you're not, you're, and your mucosa is damaged, your brush border enzymes are damaged, you're going to really struggle with digesting and absorbing these things. This can also cause things like fructose intolerance, fructose malabsorption, and this can also be really connected to histamine intolerance as well, because DAO is one of the enzymes that's produced in this, in this exact same part of the digestive system. So in this case, we need to work on supporting the gut health. We need to work on healing the mucosa. One of the best things you can do for that is a good probiotic. If your gut's damaged, the only way it rebuilds itself is with the right microflora, so that can be really helpful. But more than that, just applying everything else that you've learned above here is gonna be really helpful. Add some stock and broth, add some egg yolks, some, some fatty fish, Make sure you're getting like good forms of protein. Make sure you're getting good forms of vitamin A. You'll more than, more than cover the basics and that'll be more than enough for your gut to heal itself. And finally, we have fiber. So this is kind of an exception because well, we're talking about digestive capacity and by definition, fiber is indigestible. So how does this really fit into digestive capacity? Well, it doesn't really because we don't have digestive capacity to do this. However, we are supposed to have a healthy microflora that does have some level of digestive capacity to digest these foods. So if you're seeing like solid vegetation in the stool, it's normal for, it, to some extent this is normal. You know, if you eat sweet corn, you're gonna see some in your poop, that's, that's normal. But if you're eating things like, like say like carrot soup or pumpkin soup, and then you go to the toilet and you're seeing like the, 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 the same colored pigments, or you eat like, and you're seeing like chunks of carrot and chunks of squash, that's an indicator that your microflora is deficient. And in this case, you're gonna to wanna to work on in improving the health of the microbiome. So doing all of this is gonna be helpful, especially this part here, including fermented foods. And you could also use a type of, some type of probiotic that could be really helpful. I've done another video all about probiotics. I would check the video, it's called Healing Histamine Intolerance with Probiotics. That's gonna give you plenty of detail about probiotics. So, to recap, these are the key points. Nutrient density, you wanna focus on having, eating, making sure that you have higher amounts of foods that are higher in nutrient density. This doesn't mean remove all of those other foods that you love. I still eat bread, I still have cereal occasionally, that's fine. Just make sure that you're having your liver, make sure you're having your egg yolks, make sure you're having your fish, make sure you're getting all of the things that you need. Look at the bioavailability of these foods. So this is really important, and once you've learned this, it will completely revolutionize how you look at food. So general rule of thumb, animal foods are always completely bioavailable. So the nutrition statistics on animal foods is accurate because animals have legs so they can run away. Plants, they needed a different way to defend themselves so they create anti-nutrients like phytates, like oxalate, like salicylates, like other types of plant chemicals. So instead of running away, they just poison you instead. This doesn't mean they're bad, and if you have the digestive capacity to tolerate them, fantastic. But just bear in mind that the same amount of iron that's present in spinach or the same amount of calcium that's present in spinach is not actually accurate based on what the label says because there is no, there is no measurement for these anti-nutrients against the available nutrients. So this is something that's really important that you understand. I'm not saying plant foods are bad. I love plants. Plants are awesome. Just know they don't have the nutrition content that they're said to have on the label. Digestibility, how you prepare your food matters. General rule of thumb, the smaller it is, so if you blend it and it's just a liquid, it's easier. But think about this when we're looking at fried eggs versus scrambled eggs. Think about this when you're looking at fish that's boiled versus fish that's cooked on a barbecue. Think about this when you're looking at having 
a raw carrot versus a carrot soup. You know, just bear these things in mind. These, these do make a big difference. And finally, we've got digestive capacity. If you eat a food and you do not digest it, not only does it not help you, it actually makes you more sick. So don't eat food that you can't digest. This doesn't, this is not an excuse to starve yourself. That's not an excuse to have a calorie deficit. I'm not a fan of that. That is not what I'm telling you here. What I'm saying is figure out what foods you can eat and what foods you can tolerate, and especially the bioavailable ones, and then work on figuring out where you have gaps in your digestive capacity and support them appropriately with dietary changes and supplementation. If you want more information about how to do that, I will leave a link to the five pillars course. It's a course that's, that walks you through the five pillars, stomach acid, digestive enzymes, bile, motility, mucosa, and the microbiome, so that's also included. And it also includes a day in the life of the five pillars. So what does it actually look like to live a day where, you've, where you're doing this? If you're interested in that, I will leave a link below. I try to keep it very affordable. It is the class that everybody needs to see. It's the fundamentals, the basics of what your digestive system is, how it works, what's happening when it doesn't work, and how you can support it through dietary and supplemental changes so that you can build your digestive capacity so you can tolerate food again. So it's the bare bones basics. There will be a link to that below. If I have any questions, I would be more than happy to answer them. So I'm going to have a check now. If you do have questions and you haven't written them down yet, now is your time to write them so that I can answer them for you. Let's take a look. Cool, we do have questions, fantastic. So I'm gonna go through. If you've already asked a question, I will get to it. If you haven't asked it, now is your chance to ask because once I finish, we're done. So ask your questions now. Andre says, hi, what are your favorite B-complex supplementations that you would use alongside food to heal faster? So personally, I way prefer whole food forms. As I said, liver, absolutely your best form of, of B vitamins. You're not, you are simply not going to be liver in forms of bioavailability, in forms of nutrient density. And it's a complex, you know, B vitamins are important, but you also need the retinol, the vitamin A. You also need the heme iron. You also need all of the other cofactors and complexes and minerals that go alongside it. So getting it from a whole food is always gonna be better. As far as uh, B complex supplementation, it's so hard to say. Any B supplement that I would suggest, I would have to make a personal, a personal caveat or recommendation based on your methylation profile. So you'd have to basically do the 23andMe test, take a look at your genetic single nucleotide polymorphisms. So looking for things like the MTHFR variant with uh, B9 and B9 synthesis and, and folate and your B12 levels, because these things all work together and understanding the, and looking at these things can be the difference between a B, a B complex making you feel better versus making you feel worse. And this is why, if it is at all possible, every single time I will always use food because food, you, you, if you don't have a physiological intolerance, the, the food is balanced in such a way where you get the exact right amount of, of minerals and vitamins in the right amount. And that's just the best way to do it because nature is smarter than any supplement company. So you'd need to really have an individualized um, suggestion on what type of B-complex would work for you. I've tried many in the past. I really think that just doing it through food is so much easier and better. So that would be my suggestion. Kian says, looking good and healthy, brother. Thank you very much. Great topic. Yes, I agree. Very, very, very good topic. Kian says, yeah, liver. Oh, cool. You're still here, Kian. Awesome. I'd love, love to have you. Yeah, liver. Absolutely. Yeah, liver. So you can see we've got, how many times do we have liver written on the board today? We've got one. We've got two. We've got it two, but... Still, it's the powerhouse, you know, take away from today's lesson. Forget everything you learned here. If you can eat liver, eat it and everything will fix itself. <laughs> it's not that simple, but it really will help. So just moving down, Kion says, I have so much of an easier time with meat broth than I do with bone broth. This is really important. And I'm going to go into this because this is an important distinction. So meat stock versus bone broth. What are they? What's the difference? Meat stock is where you're making a broth but instead of it just being the bones, you're also including the skin, some muscles, ligaments, tendons. If you can get the feet and the head, like with, when we do broth over here in, in, in Portugal, we get like, the, they do something over here called, called canja. And it's really nice. They like basically make this whenever, whenever anyone's feeling ill. It's basically two egg yolks, like two ovaries basically from a chicken and all of the organs, the neck, uh, the feet and like half a chicken. So it's like the perfect blend of 
all of the different types of things that you need. And the reason that this is better is you've got more of the gut healing substances. So you've got more of the glutamine, the, there's, there's a lot of like polysaccharide compounds that can be really helpful for healing the gut. And you get lower levels of the, like the glutamate and the things that can be really stimulating. You have lower histamine levels, you have lower glutamate levels, and it's, it's not only is it more healthy and more beneficial, it's way better tolerated as well. So um, really good comment, Kian. I really like it. It's, 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 it's very true. I find that it's so much, so much better tolerated. Kian also says, I love that. You're going to heal regardless. Yeah, you definitely are. Like, if you've made it this far and you're this dedicated, you, you're already on the path, right? You're already going to heal. Jonna says, I've saved this for later. Thanks, my genius friend. You're, you're most welcome, Jonna. I hope you find this helpful. Jody said, I used to eat a lot of carrots and my skin turned orange. Does this mean I was absorbing it well or not? This is really interesting. This happened to my brother as well. And this was something I was concerned about happening to me at some point as well. So what's happening here is, this is exactly what I was talking about when we're looking at the difference between carotenoids versus actual true and real vitamin A. So first of all, this is completely harmless. This just happens because you're, you're digesting them, you're absorbing a good amount, but your conversion rate is low. So you're absorbing a lot of carotenoids. So it's actually very appropriate that they're called carotenoids because this is where they were discovered in carrots. But these are basically pre-retinol. These are pre-vitamin A substances. And this shows that you're, you're, you're consuming, you're digesting and absorbing higher amounts of, of this compound, but your body's conversion rate from this pre-vitamin A carotenoid into actual real true vitamin A. And it's storing it so carotenoids are fat soluble. It's storing it in a, a fatty membrane just beneath your skin. So that's why it makes your skin look a little bit orange. It's completely harmless. What I would suggest is probably swap to a different food that has a different type of carotenoid color, like, like, a green, like greens, for example. And for some reason, I don't know why, this only happens with orange colored vegetables, especially carrots. It doesn't, you don't turn green if you, if you do too much kale. Otherwise, I definitely would have turned green a few years back. <laughs> so I don't know why that is, but yeah, this is a completely normal thing. Probably just wanna switch up a little bit. It's totally normal. Cora Martin says, uh, I have a problem. I do not like, I guess that's, I guess that's liver. I don't like liver. And I wouldn't be surprised if that was what you've said because I know a lot of people don't like liver. So some good alternatives if you don't like eating liver, you can get desiccated liver capsules. So these are like little capsules. You take them just like a supplement. If you can eat liver and you can tolerate it, just, just eat it. It's so much easier, it's so much cheaper. But if you really don't like liver, you can buy capsules. And these are desiccated, they're concentrated, so they have all of the, the, the moisture removed, so they're really concentrated. So you eat, a cap, you eat like four capsules that are like this size, but you're actually eating about 70% 70, 70 bigger size of, of liver. So even though you're eating four capsules and it's only like this big, you're actually eating like this much liver. So it, it can be quite a good way to get the B vitamins, the vitamin A, and not actually have to taste it. Another cheaper alternative is to cook some liver up, cut it up into small like ice cube sized pieces or, or smaller. And then when you're eating your food, just pop one of these out of the freezer and just put it in your mouth and swallow it with the rest of your food. This way you're getting like a whole food form version of it. You don't have to taste it, it's frozen, it's tasteless, and it just goes into your gut and it will just digest along with everything else that you're eating. So if you incorporate this like with every meal that you eat, you're just gonna supercharge the amount of nutrition that you're getting. Uh, Joanne Grimmer, nice to have you Joanne, says, should we be concerned about the high level of copper in liver? I, I wouldn't be, personally but obviously like all things come in moderation. I'm saying like eat liver, eat liver, eat liver. Like yes, eat liver like responsibly. So I like to have pate on my toast and I'll have that at the minute I'm having it every day. I'm probably not gonna do that for the rest of my life. I'm trying to trust what I actually feel like eating. So that might change and it kind of has changed. Like I have scrambled eggs in the morning now. So that's, that's, that's changing by itself. So I wouldn't do, just make sure you're not doing it like you're not overdoing it. Obviously if you eat, too much of anything is not healthy for you. It can make you, it can put you out of balance. So as long as you're eating it, being mindful of what balance actually looks like. So I would say like at an upper limit, I would probably be having, if you're having a bit of pate every day, that's great. If you're having like a full meal where like the full protein source is liver, I would probably do that like maybe two times a week would probably be optimal. It's really hard and I don't think anybody has ever overdosed from vitamins and minerals in whole food form based foods. So I know there can be a lot of concern around like 
there being too much vitamin A because liver has an astronomically high level of, of vitamin A. But assuming that you're eating it like, like a normal person and you're being kind of reasonable with yourself, you, you shouldn't run into any problems. Obviously, there are always exceptions to the rule. But in general, most people watching this probably aren't eating any liver and they'll probably benefit from eating some. That's why I've put so much emphasis on, on the liver today. And Heather Forbes says, very informative, thank you. You're most welcome, Heather. So that's everything for t from today's video. Don't have any more questions. So if you do have any questions after this, please feel free to leave them as a comment. If you're watching this on YouTube after I re-upload it, absolutely feel free to leave a comment as well. I'll get back to every single person. I wanna make sure that you, you it's important that you ask me questions because first of all, it helps inspire me to make other videos. This video was inspired, I cannot remember your name, but this video was inspired by somebody that said, what am I supposed to eat when I have SIBO? So whoever that was, thank you very much for the inspiration. But this video was made from somebody asking me a question. So give me your questions, even if you're not live, help me understand where your gaps in understanding and knowledge are so I can fill them, so I can help you heal. You know, that's why I'm in this. I don't just like to sit here and wear my voice out and talk for an hour for no reason, you know, I'm actually trying to help you heal. So ask your questions, help me understand where your gaps in your understanding are so I can help you find healing. That's everything for me today. I'll see you soon. Give me a thumbs up if you're watching on Facebook. Give me a heart. And if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you subscribe. And I'll see you soon. Ciao.